we, we have a live case coming, so I'm going to skip through a bunch of these slides because we, we have about maybe five, seven minutes. So there, there's there's a lot of stuff we could go through, and, and you know, embolic stroke is probably still a relevant problem. What we don't know are these silent microembolic events clinically relevant. And the fundamental question is, can we improve outcomes with embolic protection devices? And how do we define what's an improved outcome? Uh, the neurologic event rates are decreasing. We've seen this across trials, but it's not gone. Um, and it's all in the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, how the assessment's done. If you have neurologists see the patients, stroke rates are higher. But if you look at it, stroke rates are probably in that 2 to 3% range. This is TVT. These are clinically apparent strokes. These are not neurologist adjudicated strokes. Um, and we've seen that there's really nothing related to experience. People have looked at multiple predictors. Outside of new onset AFib, you know, there's not a lot of anatomic features that have stood out uh, across different trials. And we've seen that in the majority of patients, they still, if you do MRIs, more than two-thirds have uh, evidence of debris on, on their aortic valve. So the question really comes, if embolic events occur, why not prevent them? And will it improve outcomes? So, I mean, the ideal embolic protection device would be easy to use and deploy. It would protect all cerebral vessels. It would capture all debris, and it wouldn't restrict cerebral flow. You know, the only the device that's uh, recently got approved by the FDA, the randomized trial is done in the U.S. It's the Sentinel system. This is a dual filter system, uh, basically placed from a right radial or brachial approach through a six French sheath. Uh, it has a filter size of 140 uh, microns. Uh, and uh, basically, one size accommodates most vessel anatomies, but it's not all. Um, and, you know, and so the proximal filter is for 9 to 15. The distal filter is from 6.5 to 10 millimeter carotids. Um, and it's a deflectible catheter that f helps facilitate cannulating both from the right radial. And so basically, you go from the wrist, place one filter in the nominate, one filter in the carotid before you cross the valve. And the idea is you protect three of the four vessels. The left vertebral is not protected with this device. And that becomes an important question. What does that mean if you're not fully protected? Uh, and that accounts for 10% of blood flow to the brain. But because of the circular willis, it is a larger percentage of the brain that still has, depending on how their circular, the patient's circular willis is, you make a, account for a larger percentage percentage of the brain than 10%. Um, this was from the, M this was not, we did not have MRAs in the trial, but if you look at sort of the anatomy, you know, the protected brain volume is 74%, and the partially protected uh, and unprotected is really about a quarter. The partially protected is because of the circle of Willis, so there, there, are, there is still flow to large territories, and there is some protection. The TriGuard device uh, is a filter that's placed from the, the femoral artery. Um, it's from a nine French sheath, but that nine French sheath from the femoral also allows for the pigtail to go through. It's not a filter that captures debris. The concept is basically a surfboard sitting across the arch that uh, deflects debris. So, you know, the case for embolic protection is the carotid stent experience. There's been no randomized trial in carotid stents. But using a filter during carotid stenting is mandatory for a reimbursement. Um, and we've seen that larger uh, MRI abnormalities are associated with higher levels of uh, neurologic abnormalities. A bigger question is these MRI abnormalities and do they, are they benign? The, there's a consensus statement that says, suggests they may not be, but is it different when they're physiologic versus when, when they're procedural and they uh, are, are different? Uh, but it may re result in worse longer-term outcomes. And studies have shown that embolic protection devices do reduce MRI abnormalities after TAVR. The first randomized trial was clean TAVI, showed about a 50% reduction in lesion number and volume uh, by MRI, and that's what led to the Sentinel study, over 300 patients randomized in the U.S. and, and Germany. But its primary efficacy endpoint was reduction in DW MRI abnormalities. And although there was a reduction, it didn't meet clinical significance. The reduction number was approximately the same as we saw in clean TAVI, but it wasn't clinically significant. P-value was 0.33. And there's a lot of reasons why it may not have been met its endpoint when clean TAVI did. It was a multicenter versus single center. Uh, there was greater variability, multiple valve types used. Clean TAVI was just core valve. We used core valve, Evolute, XT, and Sapien 3. More variability in the timing of the MRI, uh, and, and that leads to D DWI lesions uh, go away over time. So depending on variability, you may have more. 
uh, lesions or not, more operators with less experience. In patient populations were different. There's mo more baseline disease. And we saw the burden of baseline disease led to higher uh, event rates. And MRI may not be a good surrogate endpoint. Um, and, you know, stroke is, is like real estate. It's about location. All three patients had a clinically evident stroke, but these are their MRI abnormalities. And so a small lesion in an eloquent area may cause a clinically apparent event where others may not. So MRI may not be a good surrogate endpoint because it, 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 sheer volume may not be what's relevant. And when we look at clinical stroke outcomes, they were lower in the device arm versus the control, but not significant. Um, but they were, the device itself was very safe. And the idea is a lot of these strokes occur not in the, in the procedure itself, but after. So the device obviously is only going to prevent the strokes that occur in the procedure. And when we looked at the data for strokes within 72 hours in the Sentinel trial, there was a significant reduction in clinically apparent strokes. And the filters in, in the majority of patients, 99% of patients captured debris from thrombus to arterial wall to valve tissue. And many of these de much of this debris was not small. Uh, at least 50% of the patients had a, a debris particle at least one millimeter in size. And when you look, this may be a sheer numbers issue. This was a meta-analysis published of five embolic protection trials, and it showed a significant benefit in terms of uh, death and stroke uh, when you pull these trials together. So there, may, there is benefit, I think, in these trials. And the REFLECT trial with the TriGuard device was enrolling, but they just halted enrollment this month. The reasons are not fully clear, but uh, their, their plan is to restart enrollment with their next generation device. So there may be benefit beyond, uh, beyond stroke reduction. There may be benefit in cognitive improvement, but those are difficult to assess. But the reality is if we can prevent embolic protections, why not do so? Uh, and if you, you can prevent debris from going to the brain, we should. There's a lot of reasons why people say not to. Stroke rates are decreasing. We don't protect all vessels. In additional procedure, it becomes more complex. But a lot of times, it comes down to cost. It's another t additional cost to a, a, very, a procedure that is already very difficult. And the reality is, you know, we wouldn't drive without a seatbelt. We can't predict when these events are going to occur. You'll never know when you need protect protection. So I, I would sort of argue that we should use it if the patient anatomy is suitable. Thanks very much.